I think the major premise is that most people think that all veterans go to the VA for their health care. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Only about 15% of America's veterans use the VA for health care. So it's very important for people in private practice or in the communities to really realize that the person that they are seeing may have a military history. And one of the things I hope to bring to the attention of the folks is the fact that over the years, certain during different wars and different um, periods of, of hostilities, ex certain exposures, for example, I served during the Vietnam War, and so Agent Orange is very important. But many of the, for many years, people did not recognize that, first of all, uh, the, the person before them was a veteran, or that what they were exhibiting were actually the signs and symptoms of known diseases, which is associated with the service and exposure to Agent Orange. So one of the things that because of today's military and the way in which we are relying very much on our guard and reservists, we're not having big bases uh, like we had in the past. We're not going to have huge VA hospitals. So it's incumbent on all of us in the healthcare uh, professions to be aware of the fact that just asking a few simple questions, for example, have you ever served in the military? and what did you do in the military and where were you stationed can be as important as any diagnostic information that you could get in the history of physical. Blast concussions or traumatic brain injuries are part of being in the military. Um, my father was a gunner on a destroyer during World War II. Um, he had traumatic brain injury, we just didn't know what to call it. Mm -hmm. and the blast concussions that we know today, the subtleties of the post-traumatic stress disorder and the mental health issues that come, but also for someone who has both post-traumatic stress and a traumatic brain injury, it's very hard to find a way out of that uh, particular dilemma. Where only 2% of the active duty force during Vietnam was women, um, now they're almost 20%. And where many people did not have families, now almost 85% of the people in uniform have a family. And I think it's really a very um, impressive statistic that over one million children in America have had one or both of their parents deployed since 9-11. One million children. Uh, many of our troops do not have the opportunity to really get over the first deployment when they're asked again, and especially here in North Carolina, Fort Bragg. Um, all the tasking that has been given to them, and of course they do uh, answer the call, but that will have a lot of effect, not only on their present family, but for the, the generations to come. So it's, uh, it seems fortuitous and also, also a game changer that the way that we're doing war is not, we're ha not having big bases, and the way in which we deliver care has to change to meet those challenges. I'm very proud of the fact that we started a program um, called the Military Support Program. Mm -hmm. uh, because VA is kind of landlocked in who it can take care of, mm -hmm. and because we saw the need for our reservists our, and the people with families in the National Guard. The state of Connecticut uh, set aside uh, $1.4 million mm -hmm. for healthcare services that were not covered by the VA. What we did was we uh, have a 16-hour module of taking clinicians who are in private practice right now. It's called Military 101. And that, that is a training that they go through. Once they complete that training, then they become part of our military support network. So if someone should call the hotline, as we call it, uh, and say, uh, I live in Pocatuck, Connecticut, and my husband is in Iraq or Afghanistan, and I'm having some problems, the hotline will give you the names of clinicians in your geographic area
who have gone through this training. And the part, for the clinician's part, is that they have promised that within 48 hours of somebody giving them a call from this hotline, someone who sought help, that they will return that call and, and start working with them. They will at least know enough to ask the person before them if they have ever served in the military. Because if they have served in the military, they'll say yes. If not, they'll say no, my husband or my brother. So you'll get a, you'll get a sense if there is a military connection there. The other questions to ask are, um, you know, what did you do in the military? Where were you stationed? Because there are a lot of occupational and environmental exposures mm -hmm. that have long-term health consequences that treaters need to be aware of. But it opens the door also to if you do find a veteran and you do get the answers to these questions, then the next move is, you know, you need to incorporate this into your considerations as you make the assessment and uh, when you're looking for treatment and diagnosis. So this is a very beginning, but it is a game changer, and it's not like we're asking for a multi-million dollar uh, grant. It's something that I'm hoping the nursing students at Duke will incorporate into their practice.